1 Samuel chapter 17, verse number 33. 1 Samuel 17, 33. Familiar passage, I'm sure, for most of us. And Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him. For thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his his youth. And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept thy father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear, and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went after him, and smote him, and delivered it out of his mouth, and When he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he had defied the armies of the living God. It's not where I'm going this evening, but I just feel impressed to stop for a moment. You're supposed to slay giants in private before you slay them in public. Before David ever faced the Goliath on the battlefield in front of everybody, he learned how to defeat some adversaries when it was just him and nobody else. You don't spend time alone with God and let God let you slay some giants, just you and him. You're never going to be ready for the day when you stand on the battlefield and everyone's looking at you. Saul says, you got no business doing this. And David says, well, let me just tell you what I have done. David said, Moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with you. Didn't take long for Saul to change. And Saul armed David with his armor. And he put a helmet of brass upon his head, and he also armed him with a coat of mail. And David girded his sword upon his armor, and he essayed to go, for he had not proved it. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off him. And now watch what he does. He takes his staff in his hand, gets five smooth stones from the brook, puts them in his shepherd bag, which he had, walks out with his sling in his hand to face the giant. Saul says, here, you can go. Let me give you my armor. And he put it on, started to go, but recognize I haven't proved this. Father, thank you for the privilege again this evening of being together with fellow believers and being in your presence, Lord. Thank you for your presence that has been manifested here tonight, God. I don't know what all you've done, but I felt and sensed in my spirit you did some things as we were praying and ministering here earlier, and I thank you for that, Lord, in Jesus' name. I pray, God, that you would speak to us tonight. Thank you, Lord, so much for all that you're doing. Thank you for what you've done this last four to six weeks in this congregation. And thank you not only for what you've done, but what it means as to what you're doing and where we're going. And we want to continue to have ears to hear and hearts that are open to receive that you might order our steps so that we can and we can. Find the fulfillment of your promises in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. You may be seated. I want to read to you the definition of this word, assayed. It's an interesting word. I would, If I was just guessing what the word meant based on the context of the verse, I would say that He essayed or he he tried to go in Saul's armor. But that word, according to Strong's, it's a primitive root, probably rather the same as the Old Testament word 2973, through the ideal or the idea of mental weakness. Properly to yield, especially 
assent, hence to undertake as an act of volition or an act of the will. It, it's the idea of mental weakness. And then Brown, Driver, and Briggs Hebrew lexicon says the word assayed means this, to begin, to make a beginning, to show willingness, to undertake to do, to be pleased, to be determined, to agree, to show willingness, to acquiesce, to accept an invitation, to be willing. Again, Strong says it's the idea of mental weakness. David gave in to a moment of pressure, if you will. He knew the weapons he was skilled to use. He knew the time he had spent learning how to use the sling. He knew how skilled he had become with that weapon. But I, I, I'm pretty sure, and I think if it was me, there would have been something pretty cool about the king offering for you to wear his armor. You're a 17, 18 year old kid, I think somewhere in that range, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, and, and the king says, well, here, put on my armor. I mean, that's like, I know all this part of it's like, ew, whatever, but there's another side of it some of you, I think, will get. That, you know, that'd be like Michael Jordan saying, here, put on my, my sneakers, the ones, the ones I've been wearing. Oh, yeah, I'll, I'll put those on. Maybe if I put them on, I can jump like Mike. Although I think I can jump like Mike now. I'm kind of doubting he jumps the way he used to jump. He, he had a moment of mental weakness. He, 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 he started to give in. He started to try it. And no doubt, if he would have made the mistake of going out in Saul's armor... David would have got, I am confident, would have gotten killed. <laughs> and so, I, I, I want to use this, I guess, kind of as a launching point to uh, talk to you kind of about something in a couple of different ways, I guess, this evening. There, there's a couple of words and I, I want to give you... Again, probably can't read, but I'll tell you what it says, then you'll know. The word principle, principle, a principle. And then a couple of words that I want you to hear them in the context of this. They're, they're, I mean them kind of, and I'll explain here in a moment, in contrast to this word Principle. Let me, let, me, let me insert this. To me, the word principle implies to some degree flexibility. Meaning, not that the principle, the principle is flexible, but the application of the principle is flexible. A bunch of you have heard this statement. Bishops used it numerous times, and I'm pretty sure Brother Mike Yu is the one that coined the phrase. That at Antioch we are rigid in, flexible, rigid in principle. Here's the principle, but how it is applied may vary. And so a couple of words, and again, I don't, not necessarily here in the, if you go look up Webster's Dictionary or whatever, you're probably going to get something a little bit different. So please just in the context of, of this here tonight. Doctrine, a, a rule, a law. Now, to me, those things imply rigidity. That, that's set. It's established. It's, it's, a, it's clear. It's clearly defined. Can I tell you, and if, let, me, let me use, uh, I kind of reluctant to do it, it's sort of, I don't know, a secular, whatever, carnal, natural statement, but most of you will definitely understand what I mean by the statement. There's a, there's a whole lot more to what we do, relationship with God, ministry, 
personal relationships, whether that's marriage, family, friendships, etc. There's a whole lot of it that's way more of an art than it is a science. I think we're going somewhere. I, I kind of feel like you're a little uncertain about that right now. <laughs> And so there, there's, let me, let me, I'll give you the sort of the punchline, the two things. There's two things I, I, it's my hope that you take away from tonight. One is not to let others try to put their armor on you. I'll say it that way. <laughs> not to let somebody take what is a principle and a, imply to you that it's a doctrine or a rule or a law or a, so number one, not to let that happen, but number two, to not do that to others. I'm going to come back to this here in a little bit, but if we're not careful, we can make our experiences in a variety of ways, and I'll give you an example or two here in a few minutes, but we can make our experiences the rule. Well, this is how it happened for me, so that's how it's going to happen for you. Well, this is how God deals with me, so that's how God... What's the principle? Share the principle, yes. But don't try to take your armor and put your armor on somebody who's been trained to do something differently. Let me, let me see if I can kind of give you a, uh, uh, a little bit more of a... Of a I don't know, a mental picture of what I'm trying to say. I think everybody pretty much knows what that is on the right side of the screen up there. And just in case you don't, that's the outline of a basketball court. Pretty sure everyone knew that. There are, there are rules that govern the game. Those, those uh, I'll go ahead and use my nifty little pencil some more. That, these, these lines here, you touch those, you got the ball and you touch those lines, you're out of bounds. If the ball touches that line, it's now out of bounds. If you, if you shoot behind this line here and make it, it's three points. You shoot anywhere in front of that line and it's only two. There, there, are, there are rules for when a foul shot is being made and, and, and how you can stand. This is, this is called the key for all of you non-basketball folks. I'm not sure I really know why it's called the key. It's just called, that's, uh, I don't know, I don't, I don't look like a key or what, I don't know. There are rules that govern the game. There are rules you play by. You, you, don't, you, don't, you don't go and, you know, if you're playing a game trying to play fairly legit, whether it's a pickup game or not, you, you, you don't sit there and say, well, you know what, I think we can, uh, let, let's not use the sidelines today. You know what, we're not, let's not have the out of bounds today. No, because you, you know there, there's actually benefit to those rules. They bring order. They eliminate chaos and confusion. If, if you didn't have the lines, if you didn't know what the boundaries were, you'd be all over the place. That's not fun. It may be frustrating if you got the ball and you step on the line unintentionally and you lose the ball, but there's still benefit in at least knowing. And so while that, and there, there's a lot of other rules, but, but, but especially in the context of what you can see up there, the, those, are, those are set. They're not flexible. If your foot is on that three-point line, touching it just the least bit detectable way, it's a two-point. you got to be behind the line. That's That's set. But within the playing of the game, there's flexibility. What I mean by that is, there's a couple of phrases now. Every single time I say them, all I can do is think about Brother Hurt. 
what I'm saying is, <laughs> what are you saying, Brother Wright? <laughs> it, there, we, we got a, a couple guys in here. I know that uh, we, we, I'll put, we used to play ball, basketball. Used to play basketball a lot. I don't know when the last time I've actually played a basketball game. I've, I've moved on to other sports. I haven't quit sports. I've just moved on to other sports. <laughs> but you know what? If, if you, I, I can remember, I, I was after, right after I graduated from Antioch Christian School, the very next year I immediately started working with Brother Humphrey and became an assistant coach. And um, almost without fail, every year at some point in the beginning of the year, he would have me go over with, with the team what the, the fundamentals of a jump shot were. So I do that. I, you know, you, you, you got your balance and all this stuff and, and, and line, squaring up to the basket and you shoot and you follow through and, and you kind of hold that, especially when you make it because, you know, it just looks really pretty. It doesn't look too pretty when you do that and you miss it, but, you know. So I, I was known to be a decent outside shooter, and so he, he would have me. But I got to tell you, I've seen some guys that put the ball in the basket more consistently than I ever did, that if you look at them, they're not squared up to the basket, good balance, good form. We got a guy who used to play years ago, and we'd play in the little tiny gym. Some of y'all have no idea what that's all about. The little gym, it really, it, it wasn't even as, it may have been as long as this building is wide. I don't think so, actually. Back in those days, we'd play every week, we'd play pickup games, and there was one guy, he had... He had the ugliest form. But you leave him open? There's nobody that's around here anymore, so don't be trying to figure out who is Brother Wright talking about. He, why? Because it's, you, you got to watch the lines, you got to do, but, but when it comes to how you as an individual, there's, there's principles. <laughs> The, the ultimate principle is get the ball in the basket. If you can stand there and do it and look pretty, do it. But if you look ugly but it gets in the basket, just get it in the basket. <laughs> and, and, and so again, if we're not careful, we can create these standards that we expect everybody else around us to abide by. I'm not, there is doctrine. There are things in Scripture, except the man be born of the water and the Spirit is not a principle. Right. <laughs> that, to me, that's a doctrine. <laughs> one Lord, one faith, one baptism. That's, a, that's not a principle that we apply with some degree of flexibility. That, that's set, that's established. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. That's a, that is set. That's a law. That's a doctrine. When it comes to how we function, again, and, and I'll say in, the, in, in, in these two primary areas for right now, in, in your relationship with God and in your ministry. I don't know how many oikos do we currently have? 21 Oikos right now in Antioch Central. You know what? There's a lot of diversity in the way those deacons, the de we call the leaders of our small groups deacons, there's a lot of flexibility and, and, and differences in styles in the way those deacons function. There's some principles that we're trying to abide by. But here's part of what I'm trying to say or feel to say to you tonight. Be you. Be who God's created you to be. Do what God's created you to do the way God has equipped you to do it. If He's given you a sword and armor like Saul had and that's what you're used to, use it. But if he's given you a sling and you've learned how to use a sling, don't sit around trying to put somebody else's armor on. 
Be you. Do what God's called you to do the way God's called you to do it. Let me give you a couple areas. And this first one I'm about to touch on is really it's just kind of more intended to be more example than necessarily the, the topic per se. But I may take advantage of the topic for a moment. Dating, court, whatever you want to call it. I don't even know if I'm, whatever. Dating or courtship, engagement, marriage. That, that's the, you know, that's for a lot of people, that's the goal. That's the outcome. How you get there. There's not a set way. We, I shared, we shared with the young adults last, was that last year when we did the, session on dating and shared a brother Stan Gleason who will be ministering for us next month. His son does a podcast and uh, came across some stuff and felt like he had some really good stuff on the topic of dating and, and uh, he, he shared his story and uh, how in one of the podcasts about he, uh, he was the Lord spoke to him that this year you will meet your wife. That's pretty cool, man. I'd be like, ooh, yeah. Speak, Lord. <laughs> he tell, and tells the whole story, and sure enough, he, he met her that year. The way I recall it and understand it, he didn't really know at the moment when he met her that she was the one, but, but then he tells, and I mean, it's amazing. It's cool. It's a cool story. My wife and I started dating in high school. I don't know what dating was. It was a, at some point it went from going together. Do y'all still, they still use that term? No, that's that out of style. We, you, going together. Where are you going? Nowhere. We're going together. <laughs> we, we started dating in high school and, 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 by the time we got done high school, we were, we were pretty serious. And wasn't too long later, we were engaged. And not too long after that, we were married. And 20, almost 29 years ago. Wow, 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 wow. I, that, that's, those are very different stories. But again, if we're not careful, we can take our stuff. And imply that this is, this is how you have to do it or this is what you should expect. I, I don't know if I've ever quite addressed this publicly. I've said it to a lot of people individually, so I'm going to go on record tonight. It's my understanding. I don't know about anybody here. and I'm not even sure who, but it's my understanding there's been people around here that have told single people that you better not get married until God speaks to you and tells you who the person is. Do I believe you should make sure what you're about to do is in the will of God? If you're going to get linked up in a life, lifetime relationship, you better. But I'm just going to tell you right now, I may disillusion some of you. There was never a moment in which God spoke to me and said, Angela Houston is the one for you. In fact, I'll be real honest with you. Don't, don't, this, this is my story. This is my principle. I was, I was asking God to let her be the one long before I knew. And I'm going to tell you right now, gentlemen, I'll just tell the gentleman this. I'm pretty sure a girl's kind of interested in knowing you like her and want her before it's the will of God. Oh, Hallelujah. Well, it's... God told me, you're the one. Do you like me? <laughs> Do you think I look good? <laughs> Do you want me to be the one? Well, I don't know, God, of course. Oh, boy. <laughs> Those that usually go around saying who God told them before anything ever happens, it's usually a tool of manipulation. 
just, let me just tell you, if you're single and God has spoken to you, you have no relationship with the person and you believe God has spoken to you who your spouse is going to be, you need to hide that in your heart. For a couple of reasons. If you're wrong, you don't have egg on your face. But then the other problem is if you're going around and you start telling an honest, sincere person has got to go, okay, I either have to believe you know how to hear from God or you don't know how to hear from God. And at this point, I haven't heard from God, so you must not know how to hear. <laughs> principles, principles, principles. There, there I've, I've included one in this area, relationships, marriage. Well, there, there's definitely some, some doctrines. One of those, Paul says, don't be, un this is the Amplified, the King James says, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. The, the Amplified says, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Do not make mismated alliances with them or come under a different yoke with them, inconsistent with your faith. For what partnership have right living and right standing with God with iniquity and lawlessness? Or how can light have fellowship with darkness? That's, that's, that's not a principle. Well, you know, I, no, that's, I may promise you, you want to abide by that one. If you're serious about your relationship with God, your walk with God, with ministry, If you're single and have a desire to be a part of ministry, whatever God's called you to be, and you also have a desire to get married, your choice of who you marry is going to be one of the absolute most significant decisions you will ever make. It'll make or break your ministry. So there are some things that govern, but then... I remember, let me, let me give you another example, and I'll try to move on from this area. All my life, or at least as long as I can remember, my, my, my mom always paid the bills, balanced the checkbook. My dad was the head of the house, no doubt in charge, whatever, but my mother handled all that. You know what? We got married, and I sort of thought that must be a doctrine. And we tried that for a while. I had Angie do all the, pay the bills, take balance the checkbook, all that. She did all right with it for a couple of years until we started filling our quiver. And I had to come to terms with the fact, wait a minute. That may be the armor my parents wore. But that's not what I'm mandated to do. Oh, hallelujah. You know, I, we, we, we've, I've tried to say this many times now to young marrieds, and I'll say it to everybody. It doesn't matter if your family of origin was a wonderful, great family or if it was a dysfunctional family, which... I will tell you, I have come to the conclusion at 49 years old, every single family is dysfunctional. <laughs> every one, including mine. Some are exceptionally dysfunctional, dysfunctional. but every family has got some dysfunction. And so whichever it's, whether it's a negative frame of reference or a positive, you've got to learn who you are and what works for you. As long as you're not violating any biblical doctrines. I mean, it's like, it's like the, we probably got a couple of you folks around here that can say this one. Oh, bless God, where I came from, we were old school. There wasn't no thing called time out. Well, you know what? I wish my dad had known about timeout. <laughs> he didn't. I've said it before. I'll say it again. 
if there was a belt drawing competition like a gun like a gun competition, my dad would be the baddest dude in the East. I never even tried to match him. I just got paint sticks. That was the easiest thing to do. Somehow, all in one motion, one hand, he could unbuckle the belt buckle, pull the belt out, pap, 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 as it goes by every one of those belt loops. And by the time the hand is out here, it is perfectly wrapped with about six inches. I wish there had been a couple of timeouts. You know what? We had time out in my household when I was, we had toddlers. Not because we were sissies and wimps and whatever. Because sometimes, of course not the two that are here tonight. <laughs> Definitely not them. But sometimes you'd, you'd spank them and they'd hurt and they'd cry and they'd walk out of the bathroom with the same... There wasn't one bit of a change in the attitude, in the spirit. But I tell you what, you stick them on, off to the side in a chair and say, when your attitude changes, you can get up. Ah, they're sitting there squirming around in the chair. And every now and then, Mom, what? Has my attitude changed? <laughs> they don't know. You tell me. What, what's, what, is it about the fact we can all walk around bragging that, bless God, we didn't spare the rod? Or is it about finding out the way to most effectively discipline and train up our children in the way they should go? Oh boy, I don't know. I'm sure y'all came tonight with expecting some really, really great revelation since, you know, I have two weeks at this. But here we go. Here we are. Let me just let me give you a couple other areas here just to try to stir up your pure minds. Moses, the leader God chooses to lead Israel out of Egypt. Joshua, the leader that God chooses to lead Israel into the land of promise. Moses to me, one of the defining moments of all of that, if you will, both scenarios for leaving Egypt, it's Moses standing there holding a rod and the entire nation passing through. One man standing there holding his rod. I would suspect that as people passed by where Moses was standing, they probably looked up in kind of awe and reverence awestruck by this man standing with a rod over water that is now parted so we can miraculously walk through on dry ground. And that is exactly, obviously, because of the results demonstrate that's exactly the way God intended for Moses to lead them out of Egypt. But what happens when they get to the promised land 40 years later and now it's time to go into the land of promise? You see, if we're just going to take doctrine, rule, law, whatever other word in that context you want to take, then what should Joshua do? Well, Moses stood at the Red Sea with his rod. I guess I need to... Anybody got a stick? <laughs> I need a stick. Why? Well, because Moses had one. What are you going to do? Well, I'm going to hold it up. Well, did God tell you to do that? No, but that's what Moses did. And surely everybody's expecting something similar from Joshua. Well, what does God do with Joshua and the children of Israel going into Egypt? Or into the promised land? He says, I want you to get the priests. And I want them to carry the ark. And when their feet touch the water the waters are going to part I don't want you standing with a rod Joshua at work to get us out but that's not what we're using to get in 
And let me tell you something, there is a shift, I believe there has been, and I don't know that it's done, we may still be in it, but I believe there is a shift in the church. I, I think we could, I could say here at Antioch you've seen it, but I think it's beyond just any one congregation. There is a shift from a Moses-type leadership to a Joshua-type leadership. Moses needed to be the one. He was the one God used to, to, to lead the charge, leaving Egypt. But when it comes time to go into the promised land, to inherit what God had promised them for generation after generation, it wasn't about one person being the focus. Because no flesh is going to glory in his presence. And so we need to accept the fact, you know what? We may not seem to have. I take this however you want to take it. I don't mean it to be degrading to myself and I'm not fishing either. So don't come tell me after church or what I'm not looking for. It. Hear me in the context. I look at Bishop, I look at my dad as a Moses kind of leader. Let's go. Let's go to a city where there's no church. We don't, let's go, let's charge, and here we are. Now here I am for this congregation. I'm not a Moses. Not saying any of you are expecting me to be that. I'm just saying, I know I'm not. But here's the deal, and I don't mean this to sound defensive either, but Moses and jo or, excuse me, Joshua was not weaker than Moses. Joshua didn't have less authority and power than Moses. God just operated in him in a different way. And don't just sit here and listen to what I'm saying from the context of me as the pastor and the bishop. You need to take that and apply it to where you are and what God's called you to do. Because the same thing may happen to you. And if you can't be comfortable with a sling and some stones, you're not going to make it. You can't be comfortable with something that may not be as glamorous. You might, you might be heading for trouble. If God's called you, be who God's called you to be. Kind of, I've heard a couple guys, this is back when we first started the AML process, a couple guys, you know, that when they have a chance to preach, they get up there and try to be bishop. Walk to the pulpit, no notes, no scriptures, they're just going to flow. Let me tell you something. First time or two you get up in front of a crowd of people, try to, you're going to flow, it's going to flow for about three seconds. <laughs> and then it's going to all be gone. But you know what? I kind of doubt in the late 60s when Bishop first started preaching, I kind of doubt he went to the pulpit with 340 pages of notes that he never touched because he just flowed. See, that's another thing we do. We, we, I, I got this may not mean anything to you, may not help anybody, but hopefully it'll help somebody in some context. And, and, and within the last year or two, I, I got a revelation was very helpful to me. Because I've spent most of my life comparing myself to my dad, but in the context of me now and my dad now. So I'm comparing me to him, and he's got 20 plus years of experience that I don't have. <laughs> Said this before, I'll say it again. I mean, your parents get your, get your, if you don't get anything else I say tonight, and this will help you. I think all four of my kids probably are already smarter than I am. If they're not, they're rapidly approaching it. But I'm going to tell you what all four of them are not. They are not wiser than I am. And they will never be wiser than I am. Because I got 20 plus years on all of them. You see, the problem is sometimes we put more value 
in knowledge than we do in wisdom. Hmm. Let me tell you, let me tell you young folks something. Be careful with all your knowledge. Because there's something most of us gray-headed folks have learned. The practicality of your knowledge usually doesn't work exactly the way you think, at least. There's a lot of us that went into adulthood with high ideals that we knew. Boy, I, you know, boy, this person, but you, I know how to, I'm on. Nope. Don't work. I, my dad's got 20 plus years of experience on me. I'm, I can't compare me at 49 to him at 75. You shouldn't be doing that with anyone else. I'll, I'll just, just give you, show me something, bring it a little closer to home. I, Jacob, we shouldn't be comparing you to Mike McGurk. Fill in the blanks. Are you where you're supposed to be? Are you at the pace God has established for you? Are you developing in the areas God is wanting you to develop in? If that's the case, then, then, then that's, what, that's the goal. How Moses did it was a principle. We got to lead these people out of Egypt. So what are the principles to get us out? Not what is the way it has to be done. Think of how many things throughout Scripture, Old and New Testament, God did something a certain way one single time. One single time. There's only one David in killing a Goliath that we know of with a sling. Only one. There's only one that spent the night in the lion's den. Only one. There's... Sometimes we, 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 again, we try to make a doctrine. David wasn't looking. I think David came after um, Samson, right? David wasn't going around looking for the jawbone of a donkey when he was trying to fight Goliath. Well, Samson used the jawbone of a donkey. I guess that's what I need. No. You need to use what God has equipped you to use for the purpose God has given you. How about this? Jesus comes by the disciples when he's calling them. He just says, he just says to them, follow me. And he's got, scripture says they leave their nets. They forsake they forsake their world, if you will, what they were used to, what they could rely on. They, they let that go to follow one word, fo or two words, follow me. No, no, at least according to what's said to us in the Gospels, nothing, nothing really beyond that. No, no sales pitch. <laughs> Jesus wasn't promising them anything. He just said, follow me. But then how about this? There comes, a, there comes this certain ruler, as the scripture calls him. He comes to Jesus, and what does Jesus say to him? Go, sell everything you have. Come. Now, wait a minute. He didn't tell the disciples when he first called them. He didn't tell Peter, James, go sell your fishing boats and follow me. Go get rid of everything and come after me. But now this guy comes along, and you know, what, what do I got to do to inherit eternal life? Well, keep the commandments. Well, which ones? Well, these are. I've done that since my youth up. Okay, one more thing. One more thing you're lacking. Go and sell all that you have and come and follow me. And the Bible says he went away sorrowful. To the disciples, he says, follow me. They stop what they're doing. They come after him. To this man that actually was pursuing him, he tells, them, he tells him, go and sell everything, give it away, come follow me. And he says, no thanks. You say, well, is it unfair that he told those guys or he told the certain ruler to do that, but he didn't tell the disciples? No, it's not unfair. Because I think when he called the disciples, he recognized what was in their heart. 
And there was a willingness to abandon all, forsake all, give up all. But then this guy comes along. And Jesus recognizes you say in one thing. See, we're not careful. We'll make a well, we got to tell everybody, go sell everything and follow Jesus. Well, he, the Lord told me that I had to sell everything, so you got to sell everything. It's that, it's that same principle that I say about those that go around telling new people how they're supposed to dress or not supposed to dress. The people that do that are the people that are probably doing the things outwardly but resent doing them. And so the attitude is, well, if I got to do this, you got to do this. That, that's not the way. Well, he called me to do that. And I said, well, no. My parents had to leave behind everything they knew, come to a strange place, start a church. I, I didn't get called to do that that way. I did get called to give up everything. Maybe in a different context, maybe in a different way, because the principle applies. But how it applies, what it, what it requires of you, may be a little different than what it is of someone else. That's, that's a, one of the reasons, obviously not the reason and not even the top couple of reasons, but one of the reasons it's important for me for us to have guest speakers here is because I am not the standard by which ministry is defined. I've become pretty comfortable for the most part in who I am, who God's called me to be, how God uses me. The way I do it is not the only way it's done. And there may be somebody that comes through here. It may be somebody God sends through here one time. They may never come back. But as you're sitting there and they're ministering and you can relate to what they're doing, how they're doing it. Because we're not here to be cookie cutters. We're not here to be duplicates of each other. We're here to be who God has uniquely, individually called us to be. Let me throw this in here kind of. It's a little bit different vein, but there's a difference between a personality and a principle. And let me say this, principle supersedes personality. What do I mean by that? Well, some folks are a little bit more outspoken in their personality than others. And it can just write off their uncontrolled mouth to, well, that's just my personality. Well, I'm sorry, but there's some principles in the Word of God that supersede your personality. Your personality may be sarcastic and cutting and whatever, but there's some principles that are greater than your personality. Be who you are. Be who God made you to be. But at the end of the day, make sure all of that is submitted to what the Word of God has set up to be the principles that are supposed to govern who we are, what we do, how we do it. Not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together, as manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see, your, see the day approaching. What's the doctrine there? There's a doctrine in there. What's the doctrine? We need to get together. The doctrine in there is we need to get together. And the doctrine in there is the closer we get to the end, the more we need to get together. But the doctrine of we need to get together is not defined and focused and limited to right here. Get together here? Absolutely. But get together in your house. Get together at Starbucks. Get together at Panera. Get together at the city dock. Get together at the park. Get together on a day trip. Get together. Be together. Fellowship. Spend time together. The doctrine is we do that even more as the day approaches. But the principle is there's all kinds of different ways 
Do it in a life course. Do it in your oikos. Get together in those ways. Spend time together. But spend time together. I mean, it's just been a while since I've touched on this, but I'm just going to remind you. Thank God for the tool of technology. Thank God. But it is not a replacement for physically coming together, whether in a service or in a home group or where it is not a replacement. And you know what? We'll get on some dangerous ground possibly, but I've seen a lot of believers that have fallen in love with this last year because it fits so conveniently. I don't have to leave my house. I don't have to get dressed. I don't have to get cleaned up. I can sit here and get my church in, and I'm good. You and I, as human beings, were created with the need for touch. I know some of you don't like to be touched, but you still have a need for touch. Some of you that don't like to be touched, if you're married, you let the right person, hopefully being your spouse, put a little peck on your cheek. You like to be touched. We need. We need it. That's why it, I don't, it's, it, to me, it's, I, don't, I, don't, I can't explain it. I, can't, I don't have a psychological explanation for it, but that's just, there's something about when we see each other. We just, we, we grab a hand, we, we, because there's just that connection that can only come through physical contact. Again, we're, we use, we're going to keep using tech. Now, don't, I'm not against technology. I am against any of us thinking it can replace human physical interaction. Last, last passage, and I'm winding down. This is, this is the parable. Most of you should be familiar with it. This is the parable of the, the, the owner, the master, who's about to go away. And he, he, he's got uh, talents. He's going to leave them behind with his servants. You know, he goes to one. He gives him five talents. He goes to the next guy. He gives him two talents. And then the third guy, he gives him one talent. The master goes away. He comes back, checks on what he had left behind. The guy that had five talents given to him now has ten talents. The guy that had two talents given to him now has four talents. And the guy that had one talent given to him now has one talent. The guy with ten talents gets a very encouraging words from the master. The guy with four talents, the same thing. But the guy with one talent gets rebuked. But I want, you to, I want you to listen to what the rebuke was. I want you to listen. Matthew 25 and 26. Listen to what Jesus rebuked him for or about or the Lord in the story. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not and gather where I have not strawed. Thou oughtest, therefore, to have put my money to the exchangers. Then, at my coming, I should have received mine own with usury. I want you to notice that in those two verses where he is rebuking this man, there is no reference at all to the guy with ten talents, and the guy with four talents. The rebuke that he received had nothing to do with how he measured up to those other guys. The rebuke that he received was over what he had done with what was given to him.
Why? Because it's not you and I sitting here being compared to each other by God. He's not measuring us by each other. His approval or disapproval of my actions and my conduct is not based on comparison amongst us. I invested this into you. I invested that in them. I'll deal with that. But I invested this into you. What am I getting on what I invested into you? There's some people in this congregation that their gifting and their calling is such they have somewhat of a higher profile, if you will. They're more recognizable. They're, no, they're more known because of their, their ministry, their role. What they do, what they're called to do. But you know what? There's a whole lot of people around here that God has invested things into. But they may not be in a place of recognition or a, or a position that everyone's aware of, a title that everyone's aware of, but the significance of what God has invested in them and what God is doing in and through them is no less. You be who God has called you to be. Do it the way God has called you to do it. And don't let somebody else try to force you into their mold, their way. It's, it's, it's a part of our nature. I, 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 I'm, I'm assuming males and females do it. Maybe it's just about what we do it over. I think I would probably argue, I'm probably wrong, but I would probably argue, I think, feel like guys have a tendency to measure themselves more. But I probably not the case. It's just different things. It's, we walk into a room, and I don't know, I don't know if I still do it, but I think for a while there was at least subconsciously walk into a room of people, a smaller group of people, and look around and start... Where, 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 where am I in the, where am I height wise in this group? How do I compare? Where do I stack up? How do, what did Paul say? We don't compare ourselves among ourselves. We don't judge ourselves by ourselves. And those that do that are not wise if you put Peter the apostle Peter up here and you put Stephen up here and you read the resume of their lives while they were there, there during their lifetime read what they accomplished while they were living and Peter hands down, would have it over Stephen. He preaches the first message of the New Testament church and 3,000 people get the Holy Ghost. Other things that happen throughout. He goes to the Cornelius' house and all, all this stuff, man, all these different places and different things. And, and, and Stephen... Stephen preached one message and lost his life for one message. And there wasn't even an altar call to show something happened with the message. The moment of his death, his life appeared to be very insignificant. However, you know the story. Standing there holding garments as Stephen is being stoned is a man by the name of Saul. 
who would shortly afterwards become the Apostle Paul. If God's called you to be a Peter and stand up in front of a crowd of 3,000 people and preach to them and they get the Holy Ghost, then be that. Do it with everything in you. Do it to the best of your ability. Prepare yourself. Get equipped. Do it. But if God's called you to be a, like a Stephen, deliver a message, not even know if it really had any impact, you're no less significant than Peter. Peter's no more important because 3,000 people get the Holy Ghost the day he's birthday of the church versus Stephen. I've, I've, I've had this conversation with Brother Shelton a couple times. It's really been, I used to see it a lot. I don't, I'm not on Twitter. I may still be on Twitter, but sometimes on Facebook there. You'd see, some, you'd see some ministers who would, you know, and, and nothing wrong with it. Not, I, don't, I don't have an issue with what they were doing, so hear me out. But they'd post, you know, we were such and such a place this weekend, and 20 people got the Holy Ghost, and, you know, 15 people got baptized, and 20 people got healed, miraculous healings, and woo, you know, and I mean, there's hundreds of likes on that post. That's awesome. But then there's other people like, like a brother Shelton who a lot of times can't tweet, <laughs> can't post about what God used him to do the weekend he was ministering at a church because he spent hours and hours and hours in a living room with the pastor and his wife who were on the verge of giving up ministry and maybe even giving up on their relationship and God used him hour after hour that weekend. You, 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 don't, you don't get on Facebook on Monday and say, well, saved a marriage this weekend. But again, human nature, who gets all, who, who are we drawn to? Let's go on Brother Shelton's page. Well, there's nothing... Go on so-and-so's page. Man, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. Nothing wrong with that. Obviously, that's awesome. We've got to be content to figure out, based on the principles of the Word of God, who am I? What am I? What am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to be who God called me to be? Father, I ask you to help us tonight as we continue, Lord, individually and collectively pursuing your presence, your purpose, your power, your promises. God, for each one of us, there's a place. Many of us may be functioning in that place already, but for every one of us, you've got a place, a purpose in your body. But you've called us individually. You've called us. You've created us uniquely. God, I pray. I pray for this congregation tonight. Lord, in, in, in the various areas in which I touched on, in all aspects, I pray that you would help us as a body to learn how to, when, when there's something that's a hard, fast rule, it's an unwavering doctrine that we apply that. But when it comes to the principles that govern so many areas of our life, I pray you would give us the grace to learn how to apply those so that we can be who you've called us to be, do what you've called us to do, not trying to match up to somebody else's standard, somebody else's way to be who you've created. If you've called us, God, to wear armor and swing a sword and defeat enemies that way, so be it. But if you've equipped us with a sling and some stones and that's how you've chosen for us to defeat some giants, then give us the grace to be who you've made each one of us to be. In the name of Jesus Christ, in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Thank you for being here this evening.